What's happening, everybody? And a happy new year to you. As your repeat listeners might have noticed, I skipped over last Monday, but I'm back at it with today's guest in drum shredding, beat blast, and double strokes on the feet and speedy singles up top, the one and only Mr. John Longstreth, y'all. That's just Longstreth, not Longstreth, y'all. That'd be a strange last name. But I caught up with John just as he got off a run with Hate Eternal, and we touched on all sorts of goodness, such as his work with Origin and Skinless, and many more, as well as the challenges of recording Gorgut's Colored Sands record. And speaking of challenges, we touched on a series of milestones, or power-ups, throughout John's career that made him reassess his skill set and ultimately achieve a higher level of technical proficiency. We also delve into Van Halen, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, as well as what he sees as the evolution of death metal and more. Crash Bang Boom Podcast is available on iTunes Podcast, SoundCloud, Stitcher, my YouTube channel, and of course Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and more. Links for all set accounts can be found on my SoundCloud page. Feel free to give me a like, a positive review, or just simply subscribe. It'd be greatly appreciated. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking at releasing vinyl, go on over to NewOrleansRecordPress.com to look at myriad vinyl coloring, packaging, mastering, electroplating, lacquer cutting options, as well as a real-time quote generator. And they print both 12 and 7-inch records, as well as 150 and 180 gram variants. So check them out, y'all. And that's NewOrleansRecordPress.com. So here we go, y'all. One long-winded rant that is both informative and at times pretty fucking hilarious, if I must say so. The one, the only, John Longstreth. Let's get fucking extreme, bro. Ha ha. Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep. John Longstreth, what's happening, man? How are you making out, dude? Well, I ain't making out. I'm just kind of sitting here with you in a room. We're not making out. We're not making out. You're making out okay as, I'm as out in just general fine. in I'm life. I'm doing really good, actually. I got home back from, I just got back from a tour. I've been home for maybe two weeks, maybe a week and a half. Yeah. And my sleep schedule still hasn't bounced back to normal. Where were you and who were you out there with? We did. The we was Hate Eternal. Okay. And Cannibal Corpse and uh, Harm's Way was on there as well. Right on. Yeah, so I was playing drums for Hate Eternal. Harm's Way has a large vocalist. I'm sure you might have noticed. He's a large <laughs> vocalist. He's a that guy is cool because he's a teacher, I think. Wow. And we watched we watched some drunk dude just be a complete drunken asshole and just tear into him. And and James, you know, he just just okay, okay. He just stood there and just let him da 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 da. Give me a shirt. I don't remember what he was doing, but he was yelling about something. You know, James. I don't know how heavy that guy is, but he's big, right? A cinder block of and a who dude. Who yells at a man like that? And <laughs> somebody that drunk maniac did that, and James was like, "Okay, just gonna sit here." And right. He just took it, and the dude eventually ran out of gas and disappeared. <laughs> wow, a large pacifist of a man. I mean, I think he just knows how to handle situations. Yeah. Because later on in the tour, somebody actually said something that got his goat and he was ready to thrash the guy. Oh, so, shit. You know, it's just a case-by-case case scenario. But yeah, I mean, that dude, right. that dude was cool. Yeah. Was, I didn't really get to like, talk to those guys all that much. Right on. Are you told well, me to drink the mic or talk into my beer? Yeah, they, both simultaneously. Well, sorry to uh, interrupt. So going back to where you were, you were out with Hate Eternal. Uh, how long were you out for and how did the gigs go? I was out for seven weeks total, which was two weeks in Florida practicing with Practicing with the boss, who is, it, that's my affectionate term for Eric. Okay. Not to be confused with <laughs> Bruce Springsteen. Well, Eric is from Jersey. Oh, well, there you go. So there's so that connection. Kind of, um, <laughs> yeah, five weeks on the road. Okay. Um, five weeks on the road, main support for Cannibal Corpse. They, the Cannibal take, on this specific tour, I don't know if they always do it this way, but they take every Monday off. Really? And, you know, I, I didn't need to know what that felt like, but now that I know what that feels like... It's really nice. I bet it is. It's so nice because like with Origin, we, we see a day off and we're like, oh shit, 
oh, okay, that's a day off. That means we're going to spend money. That means we got to pay for the van. We got to do this. We're right. not going to have any money coming in. So fill that day. So we end up doing these six week runs with no days off, and we all want to murder each other in the end. Right. So we did. It was all secondary market, which is interesting. So we hit like Kentucky and Toledo, Ohio, which okay. I don't get, but I, you know, <laughs> right. You know, and like instead of New York City, we hit Jersey City, and then you know, just all these bizarre places that. I think I had been to maybe half of those cities in my my entire career. Right. Every one of those rooms was full of people. No shit. It is so crazy. Cannibal Corpse is so big that they've transcended death metal. I think I think Cannibal Corpse, I think when you got guys in slipknot shirts and five finger death punch shirts. Yeah, you, and mm, you know, and the you know, and the fucking the Slayer shirts. Right. But you have guys that don't listen to death metal, but Cannibal Corpse is their underground band. Yeah. So they go and they see their underground band. And then they look at Hate Eternal and they're like, wow, you guys are pretty brutal. Cool. How long have you been around? I'm like, whoa. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was really interesting learning that news. My, 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 my first run with Hate Eternal was great. The Cannibal Corpse guys are fucking wonderful. I've, you know, there's not a more professional band. You know, I've seen really professional bands and I've seen really nice bands. But rarely do you get both of those in the same package like these guys. Right. They're just... Super nice, easy to deal with, and they're professional. And like, what what else do you got? Okay, that's what I look up to. Well, you mentioned origin. Um, I you were originally from Kansas City, but Kansas or I always get that shit mixed up. One city, two states. The city sits over the border, right? And a river divides it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you have Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas. Okay. The Kansas City Chiefs and the Kansas City Royals actually play in Missouri. Okay. I, I, I was actually born in Wisconsin. Okay. Burlington, Wisconsin. So by the time I was five years old, I think it was 1981, we came to Kansas City. Yeah. Um, I can't, what I can't quite remember is if that had to do with my mom's career or my dad's career. Well, do either of your parents have that, that nasally North Midwest borderline Canadian uh, speech thing going on? No. All right. I get that from, I think, living in Saratoga Springs for 12 years. You don't have much of it. Sometimes I do. Oh, yeah. Hey, oh, how you doing? Well, there it is. <laughs> I date a Canadian girl, eh? Right. So you can turn it on when you need to. It's kind of like listening to somebody try and be Christopher Walken, and right. nobody's good at doing that. That's a hard one. <laughs> I've seen a couple of guys do some good impersonations, but yeah. it's not common. But no, my parents are both from the Midwest. You know. Do you come from a musical family? Yes. What, what did they play? What was on in the house? My father was a jazz pianist. And so there was always jazz in the house, and there was always musicians. There was always band practice in the house. Really? Mm-hmm. My mom was a nurse, is a nurse. Ooh. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> my mom is a nurse, and yeah. so she would work all night, and my dad would be home during the day with us. And Us being how many siblings? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. My, my half-sister at this point. Okay. My half-sister and my brother. And so, like... She would be at work and my dad would get up and, you know, he'd have band practice during the day and and then him and his guys would leave and go play a gig and my sister would watch us or the girl from across the street would watch us and all that stuff. So, so yeah, I was raised on late nights and jazz musicians. Interesting. Yeah. There was also a lot of Frank Zappa and Steely Dan. Okay. No shortage of killer drummers in either of those bands. Uh, I was just like, I knew what a good musician was before I knew how to, before I knew my vowels. Right. I think. I knew yeah. who Buddy Rich was before AI or something like that. I mean, the Steely Dan thing is definitely interesting. I know certainly that was one of the first times. It was when I heard that that song that Gad plays uh, where he does the little solo one on the tail. Asia. End. Yeah, Asia. Uh. And I remember being young and thinking, wow, that guy sounds like he can really play. I think probably before I ever even picked up a drumstick. So that was sticking, that had stuck in my head as well. Uh, so Steely Dan is a, a common thread. That is one of the quintessential drum solos of of that era and there is so much taken from that drum solo that people don't even know they're taken from it i have intentionally lifted things from that drum solo right you know first rate plagiarism i admit um <laughs> yeah you know what i will say though or the, the funny thing about gad in the 80s no matter what to this day i always think his drum sounds so fucking ridiculous it's so much of that cardboard super condensed like you know, dry, dry as fuck kind of drum sound that it drives me a little crazy. But I love listening to him. But I'm always like, damn, I kind of just I wish I would have liked to have also heard more tonal, natural sound in drums rather than cardboard. Well, that was kind of the sound back then, right? You know, guys yeah. were using guys were using really thick shells and two ply heads. That's a sonar signature 
it's from the late eighties and that's twelve ply beach. Wow. And it just goes back, you know. It's it's got all the tone in the world and at the same time kind of none of the tone in the world. I think it's sort of it's a great drum, but for those of you listening to this as well, to clue you in, we're in John's practice space with all of his drum gear in the laboratory, if you will. So we might reference random symbols and drums throughout this interview. Yeah, there's all (laughs) kinds of weird little things in here. Octobonds. Could probably pay some bills off of a lot of this. Yeah, man, sell some shit. Uh, uh, So sorry, so going back, we'll we'll do this probably more than once throughout this conversation. But uh, Going free for my jazz. Yeah, when so 2003, you leave Kansas City. Where did you go from there? Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, I've been in New York 13 years, and I don't know where that is. Saratoga Springs is halfway up the state on the east side. It's a half an hour north of Albany. Why, why Saratoga Springs? That's where the skinless guys were at the time. I think what happened was is when they had me in the band originally, they're like, oh, cool, it's the origin guy. He can do all this crazy trickery, all this double bass and these blast beats and stuff, and we'll make skinless more of a, <clears throat> more of a death metal band. And then I got there, and Sherwood at the time was discussing this more progressive uh, point of view for the band. He was like referencing that, uh, geez, the Swedish band, the Inflames, uh, Reroute to Ruin album. Okay. He was referencing that album quite a bit. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And so we got working on the music, and it was a lot of fun working on the music. Um, and at that point in time, it seemed cool. But then we got out on the road, and the differences between the personalities started to show. And, oh, that'll <clears> happen. And after a while, it was just kind of <laughs> like, ah, let's put this down. <laughs> right. You know. Nothing like touring to bring out those personality issues, huh? Well, I mean, that's the thing about, about touring is that you learn the ugliest side of your best bud's side. Uh, you know, you get to the other side of him real fast. Boy, do you. Real fast. <laughs> you know, he's got this new vocalist. He's wonderful. This and that and this and that. And then you yeah. take him on the road and three days in. Uh, what happened? You know, so if you can get through one tour with a guy and you guys are still gelling at the end, that's that's a solid dude. You For know, sure. You're, or you're a solid dude and it just, you just, you learn about what human beings are. Absolutely. You see, yeah. Like, I can't believe you would do that. Right. He's like, I can't believe you would do whatever. I'm like, oh. Yeah. I, I, okay. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. So you did skinless, and then at some point you end up back back with Origin then. Well, yeah, it was interesting because um, the skinless thing kind of petered out a, you know, almost almost a directly a year. Okay. Because I, I got to Saratoga in January, and I know that snow was hitting the ground when I had the, like a, the first big snowfall was hitting the ground when I had the, the talk with Sherwood and he's like, yeah, let's, 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 let's part ways. It doesn't quite work. Yeah. And I, right after that, I went out with skinless. I just kind of went on like a, a, a session bit, mm-hmm. went out with skinless for uh, skinless. Fuck. I went out with exhumed for two tours. Okay. So I filled in with exhumed, did two cannibal corpse tours, a U.S. and, a, can- and a, a European tour. Immediately after that, I went out with the red cord Okay. And then immediately following that, went out with Dying Fetus, opening for Gore. Jesus, dude. And then shortly after that, did a Dimmock record and jumped back in Origin. God. Okay. So, so. yeah, that was 2000. We're going to say that's 2003 to 2006. Okay. So that's three years. So that was an action-packed three years is what that sounds like. It was, yeah. Is that a blur, dude? Were you just touring your balls off? It is a blur. There was a lot of touring. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of figuring out who I was as a drummer. Yeah, I bet it was. And it actually took John Gallagher from Dying Fetus. He was just like, hey, man, um, I know you like to be flashy and all that stuff, and that's cool, but can you just like play something that resembles the same thing every night? <laughs> he goes, I'm not going to get on your case if it's a different crash symbol or if it's a different symbol. Just kind of like make it consistent so the rest of us can follow you better so we can put on a better show. That was your jazz influence maybe filtering out. Do you feel there's something yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, it was my jazz influence, and it was, it was my – my uh attention deficit no it was just me being a <laughs> me being new at it really you know and but the way gallagher put it was just like i don't know what it was he just had that because deli- i had heard similar versions of this uh-huh you know can you be more consistent can you stop fucking around right can you not play so limp wristed i'm like what you know well i haven't been told that that's funny um, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot, of, a lot of things that were presented to me that you know when you're when you're you're young and you're confident, air quotes confident. Sure. That you know if somebody says it the wrong way, you're gonna fight. 
Yeah. But the way John said, John kind of pulled me aside. He goes, look, man, I'm not here to bust your chops. I just want to let you know it'll be easier if you provide me with this. And I was just, I remember being surprised, being like, uh-huh, okay, cool. Oh, shit. And so that was, you know, like my career, I can count like multiple times where I've just been, where I've just taken steps up. Mm-hmm. Where I've just been given something by somebody and I'm like, oh, better person. Like a power up. Yeah. So that was one of those, and that was interesting. And uh, but you had to learn that on the gig. It's not like because you're, you're this was amidst a tour, so you're learning that kind of on the fly and adjusting the way you're playing. No, that works if you're good enough. Yeah, if you're good enough and you can do that, and you don't you don't throw your guitar players off because if you're a drummer, what are you doing? You're setting the stage. You're driving. You're 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 providing the foundation. Sure. You have to make it easier for these guys. Because if you were cute enough, you'd be on the front of the stage. Right. And if you had something to say, you'd be a vocalist. You don't. Sure. And you're probably short and funny looking like me, and you chew your fingernails, so you stay behind the goddamn drums. <laughs> All three. Okay. <laughs> and you gotta you grow this beard, and you hide from people. At that point in time, I, you know, I was good, but I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Yeah. And so I was fucking up a lot of guitar players for a while. Wow. You know, you can ask them. I mean, and I got... You can ask him. You can ask Matt Harvey. You can ask Noah Carpenter. You can ask John Gallagher. You can ask all these guys. Was Longsworth a fucking weirdo behind the drums and inconsistent? They'll say yeah. Yeah. Or they'll probably give you a nice version of yeah. I don't know. Sure. But. Wow. Well, you know, we didn't even get into uh, what got you into such kind of extreme. Was there a particular record or, or drum performance or, or witness in a live band or anything that led you down this path of ext- uh, pursuing such kind of you know extreme music? Your Berg Forms by Cynic, the demo version. This is before Focus. Um, it was the demo that was on the At Death's Door 2 compilation. Like, I mean, I had already been in Slayer and I was already leaning that direction. At that point in time, you know, it was like being a thrash metal drummer was what was cool. The new metal thing hadn't hit yet, and okay. like bigger, louder, faster, heavier was still kind of the thing. Fuck yeah! So it was all this Slayer and all that, and my buddy kept trying to push Napalm Death on on me. Uh huh. And it was like Napalm Death scum, and it was like Peel Sessions Carcass. That's those like uh, that that Napalm Death era is like those super short, fast songs. Nasty, right? nasty, funky grindcore is what right. it was, and I didn't hear it then yeah i you know i was still i was i've always you know from the get-go i've always enjoyed really good musicians right no matter how nasty this dude is i don't care if he's fucking just all fury if he doesn't have a good technique i'm kind of a snob about it yeah i can't shake it it's just the way it is so i just couldn't i couldn't get the napalm death stuff not till after no right. not, not till afterwards it took it took cynic and it took carcass and death yeah. And it took those bands. It took these guys that had this. T- I'm like, whoa, these guys are doing some interesting shit, you know, because death was connected at the time with King Diamond. OK, because individual thought patterns came out. Andy LaRocque was on there. Yeah. You know, I had already heard human. And that right. was what? You know, Sean oh, Reiner again. The Senate guy again. Right. That's this guy. Yeah. Ah! And then Necroticism. Like what? You know, it's like it's these like these are Iron Maiden length songs with. With all of this this chop involved, and then after a while, I started to slowly figure it out and connected all the dots, and then you know, and you know, here we are, thirty years later, and Napalm Death is one of my favorite bands now. It's funny how that happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, did you have to? Because there is a strong amount of technique involved in playing that faster music, unless you just want to completely destroy your fucking body. So how did you kind of slowly fine tune your ability to even play that stuff? I didn't like it when it hurt. When it hurt, it sucked. Yeah. I was like, this isn't fun. This hurts. My, this hurts my knees. This hurts my legs. I'm like not even, not even 19. And, and I'm like, why do, why do my knees hurt? Why do my elbows hurt? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute. Let's think back to when I was a kid. Uh-huh. There's all these jazz musicians hanging around. As a matter of fact, there's probably a jazz musician hanging around at the house right now. So I thought back to a lot of these guys that my dad was playing with, and I noticed that they were just cool. Yeah. You know, they were cool. They, and they weren't working hard. They weren't working hard with their body, but obviously they were speaking a language. Okay. They were speaking a very advanced language and frighteningly fluently. 
Yeah. You know, yeah, and it was just like, mm. was so I paid, a, I started paying a lot more attention to those yeah. guys. And it just, I just kind of noticed that it was easier to play a blast beat with, you know, wrist and it, you know, I, I took a, a, some amount of lessons for a while and he taught me the basic paradiddles and double strokes and yeah, meh, basic simple. rudiments, how to utilize bounce and wrist and all that. So I kind of took that in because I would, you know, <clears throat> these eighties guys and these like thrasher dudes are all arm. And you're reading stories about how dude can't play this stuff anymore because his shoulders are blown. And so I just I started realizing that, I don't know, I just got real nerdy about how to hit things the proper way, how loud a drum can actually be, for yeah. one thing. You get dudes that, I don't see how guys hit shit that damn hard and think it's going to get any louder. I yeah. mean, I talked to Casey Henson from Cult Leader. I don't know if you've seen him play live before, but he is a fucking wrecking ball he's one of the hardest hitting it's insanity the volume at which he plays it's crazy so i saw you did i I saw that you did a thing with kenny shalk yeah another guy that guy's a monster Mm, yeah that's one of the hardest hitting dudes with him in 2001 not only did he hit like a motherfucker but he also grooved like a motherfucker yeah he did but ken's an exceptional drummer even so for me i don't i'm not i don't think i'm not that loud of a drummer in in comparison I mean, I don't think any of the real fast death metal drummers are. Well, that's I don't know that you can because, once again, I think the harder you go for it, one, you're going to end up losing speed. I think to get that speed, it takes the technique, which is happens at lower volumes with sort of fast twitch muscles mm-hmm. and inevitably. So, yeah, I think the, it, that's just a byproduct of playing at higher BPMs. Sure. But it really didn't, it really didn't come into play until I, I met Paul Ryan and got into Origin. Okay. Because my days with my days with my first band, Angel Corpse, were were a disaster. How you so? Know? I was not a good drummer. I mean, I I had a lot of really good ideas and I was really ambitious, but I didn't know how to execute this shit. And I did not realize at that point in time that it took practicing every day. Right. That was a big piece of the puzzle. <laughs> and right. at that time, back back then, you know. I don't know if Gene was a dick or if I was just a punk ass kid or if it was a little column A, column B. Yeah. But you know, I it didn't work. So they ended up firing me and all that stuff. And I ended up meeting Paul and he's like, Well, I mean, all we gotta do is slow the song down and just do it a thousand times. Whoa. And that's another one of those little nuggets I was given where I was like, power up. Yeah. And so and then I, I started to understand I started to understand practicing for two hours before band practice. Wow. And then having band practice and then practicing for an hour after band practice yeah. and then thinking about that all night long. Yeah. And losing sleep over that. So obsessing. It was, yeah. Obsessing. <laughs> so that, so like as, as I got into origin, that's when it really started to fall into place. And by the time we had done the first album, I had figured out kind of the path that I've been on yeah. since then. Wow. Um, but yeah, cause you know, like, like through origin, we would do these, these, we would do these like these these drills, you know, these like groupings of threes or groupings of fives, you know, and all this kind of stuff. We just do this over and over again, and like it hurts. That that that's uncomfortable. That's okay. So let's adjust the seat. That doesn't yeah. make any sense. Let's sit forward. Let's lean back. Let's raise the symbols. Let's lower the symbols. Let's ergonomic adjustments. Exactly. Figure out ways that it doesn't hurt. This this yeah. You German, know. French grip, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, exactly. Which grip is going to work here? Oh, this grip works on the toms, but it doesn't work on the snare. Yeah. Oh, this grip works up here but the china's you know so a lot of that so we started you know paul was sick of uncommitted drunk musicians in topeka kansas uh-huh. and i had just come off of failure you know fucking failure dude i went i did one angel corpse record in kansas city missouri and then, I, then we went to tampa to do the second record and we were in tampa doing the second record and he's rebuilding my drum tracks on the computer. Wow. And I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't even sound like me. All of a sudden I sound like, like, like mutated Pete Sandoval. Yeah. And like, which was cool, but it sucks because Exterminate is an album that, that people talk about. I'm like, I didn't really play it. It's like, I played most of it. Yeah. So there's like an itch to revisit some of that old Angel Corp stuff, but well, who knows? A niche in the sense that you'd like to do to, to, to get back in the band and play it again and do yourself justice? I don't know if I want to get back in the band because I don't think the band is can exist anymore. Yeah. But like revisit it somehow. I don't know, re record some of that stuff or even just I just I think about it quite a bit because like 
I never got to play those Exterminate songs correctly on stage. Okay. And like I did the album and then immediately I was out. Right. And so went on went on with Origin like shortly after that. But Yeah. Do you feel like that initial instance of, of having to have your stuff fixed and whatnot, do you think that that at all put you on a path to where you were like, I'm going to get this shit down so much that I can sound as much almost like a machine as I can? Obviously, a human a human playing it, but you know, the the, the technical intensity of it and the, the specificity of it and the placement of all the notes is such a particular thing with like this tech death stuff. Yes, absolutely. Because I went down there and I, th- I had the songs down, in in a very, oh, you know, I got it, it's cool, right? You know, and I went down there and then I realized, because you know we set up at Morris Sound, and we set up in Studio B to record this album while Morbid Angel was in Studio A mixing Formulas Fatal to the Flesh. Huh. So P. Sandoval was there. The Morbid Angel guys were there, and at that point in time, death metal was still. It was a different thing back then. So right. at Morris Sound, you had the Morbid Angel guys hanging around, the Cannibal Corpse guys, the Monstrosity guys. They're coming in and out of the studio. Jimmy Hart, the Mouth of the South, from WWF came in there. Yeah. And so not only did I, you know, in my opinion, not only did I, like, drop the ball, you know, in front of myself and in front of my band members, I dropped the ball in front of the Cannibal Corpse guys, the Morbid Angel guys, the Monstrosity guys, any of the local dudes from the scene that were in being like, Yo, this is, they got the kid in there. They got the kid in there. And they go in there like, that's the kid? Oh, shit. And that's kind of how it felt. Fuck. And I'm in there with Jim Morris, you know, and I'm asking him all these questions about death and all that stuff. And, you know, and, yeah, and when it went down like that, I kind of, it took losing Angel Corpse and it took that kind of failure thing to go, I mean, are you, if we're going to be in, we're going to be full in, you know, it's not going to be this half-assed thing. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be this half-assed death metal guy that that plays the double bass every now and then. But that so, realization sounds like it could have ultimately been yet another one of these bumps that you're kind of talking about. That was the first one. Yeah. Absolutely. That was like the that was bad. That was just like yeah, like it's a shitty one. Hey, but. I'm in. I'm I'm going to be a death metal drummer, and then I get in there, and it's like you you get in there with the. It's like when CM Punk tried to fight UFC. Right. Yeah, that was a fucking embarrassing. Twice, no less. <laughs> I didn't know if he did it again. Did he, he fight did. again? He tried, man. I got to give him credit for that. But yeah. So yeah, I, I basically <laughs> I went in there. I got down to Tampa, Florida, in 1997. Only a couple years after getting into this, and got to meet the big dudes. Got to go to the big dude studio. Yeah. Got to see what it was all about and fell on my face for the most part yeah and yeah that's a hell of a way to start your career for sure now it's just kind of like ah it's funny because you know a lot of people still like to talk shit about it yeah yeah and it was that's kind of funny i mean you get like 50 about your performance with them well well, yeah like that back oh that's the dude that had to do so and so i'm like holy cow man what are you 52 years old (laughs) right what are you doing (laughs) seriously you know so yeah you get some of that you get some of that still but you know huh well, let me ask you this, man. Uh, triggers. It's something that I, I, I don't know too much about. Uh, the double bass playing that I do is at a low enough BPMs that uh, I don't really... I, it's, it's, it's not necessary. But for those listening to this that don't always understand, I guess, the uh, need for, for, for triggers, maybe tell us a little bit about what purpose do you feel they serve? Well, in, in death metal music... Ever since, not even death metal, but like ever since and justice for all. That's the first clicky bass drum. That's, That's where kick drums became a lead instrument. Right. And even so, like, and even so, with and, with and justice for all, that album came out and you had that kick sound, which is the best kick sound and the worst kick sound in the world, yeah. right? Because if you turn that up in your car stereo, bye, and it like takes over the entire mix. It's not mixed right. It's awful. There's but no you're listening to it. it in headphones, and it's just like that sound, that kick. It sounds wonderful at the same time. Um, I mean, all the Pantera records sound like that. Because yeah, of it wasn't until Pan. It, like I, I gotta say that like Pantera took it and ran with it because even though Metallica did it, Slayer didn't do anything with it. Right. Slayer just kind of kicked on with what they were doing. And Pantera picked it up and kind of ran with it. And then, you know, he's doing these cool patterns with it. And all of a sudden, the bass drum becomes a lead instrument in the music. Nobody knew how that was happening. And to this day, I, you know, Vinnie Paul would always say he wasn't triggering. 
but eh, you know, yeah. Rest in peace, Vinnie Paul. But for sure, it never it never sat well. I ain't triggering. That's a Dan Marwood beater on a click pad or on a on a quarter on a twenty four by twenty four inch kick drum. Right. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm buying that either. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't remember the last time I heard a twenty four by twenty four inch kick drum. Yeah. But he did have Terry Date mixing. So anything's possible. And, you know, not to take anything away, but hearing the Pantera records, I automatically thought I was hearing triggers. Yes, for sure. Um, hearing the Binge and Purge box set, the Metallica box set, you know, there's a lot. The Binge and Purge live show, and Lars is playing, and it's just that, that sound. I'm like, wow, he's using kick triggers. My friend's like, no, he's using a $50 million PA system. I was like, right, well, then there's fine. that. <laughs> so what kick triggers become is... That and justice for all kick drum sound realized and cultivated into into clarity, and it's just, you know it's just, it makes your kick drums really clear. It makes it really sharp. And what you're doing is you have a sound source, and you put a trigger on your kick drum, you know, or you have a trigger mounted to your pedal. Mm-hmm. This is the foot blaster trigger. Okay, and it's a sound replacement. It's live sound replacement is what yeah. it is. You know, which was the scourge of death metal after a while. Oh, he's using triggers. He's not really hitting. If you hit a trigger once, it gives you all these notes. No, it doesn't. What the triggers do is it takes your bass drum technique and it puts it right out in the middle of the dance floor where all the dudes can hear it. Right. So if you can't play your bass drums and you're triggering and it's out front, they're going to hear how fucking sloppy you are. Right. So people were getting triggering and, I guess, what, sequencing confused? Yes. So they would think that you'd hit it once and it would go twice or four times. Notes out of it, sure. Yeah. And so the way we always looked at triggering in the band was we don't have enough money to really hire a sound guy. And, you know, every time I'd show up to a gig with a double bass drum set, the dude had a 58 in one kick drum and he had a kick drum mic in the other. Okay. So he had a vocal mic. I don't know what to do with the second kick drum. So he put the kick drum mic in there and he put the vocal mic in there and the kick drum sound like bumpy, 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 bumpy. Right. <laughs> so yeah, that's one of the purposes was you would get the 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 Alesis D4 and you'd get the D drum triggers, the red D drum triggers, and you would set that up and you would fill your kick drums full of blankets and shit so it would trigger accurately. And you'd send one single line to the to the, to the sound guy and he'd be like, "What is this?" And he goes, "It's just the kick line." Goes, what, what what I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Kansas City, Missouri, by the way. Yeah. This is Kansas City, Missouri in the early 90s. Okay. So what is that? I don't know. Just, just that's the kick drum. Just here, take this line. That's the kick drum. Yeah. You know, okay. And he start bringing it up. Do, do, do. Oh, hey, wait a minute. And he like fiddle with it. And then all of a sudden, he had Pantera kick drums. Right. And you're in a shit bar in Kansas City, and it sounds wonderful. Yeah. But I think part of it is that it sort of EQs, it re EQs it to the extent that it cuts through the mix of an otherwise quickly paced and heavy style of music. I, that's kind of what I saw it as. Well, definitely, yeah. Like I said, you know, with Injustice for All, the kick drum became a lead instrument, so yeah. it needs to come out front. Right, right, right. It needs to be out there. People need to be able to hear the kick drums like they're hearing a vocal pattern or a guitar solo. Wow. And with that came more intricate, you know, footwork and all that kind of stuff. And it just, in the early 2000s, I think, people, you know, couldn't get enough of it. Holy cow, this dude's playing at 250 BPM. Yeah. That's insane. Nah, he's triggering. It's fake. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you had a lot of that. So, and like, even so, e- e- like, even with today, I play double strokes with my feet. Once you, okay, so then that's a question because I've spoken to Alex Cohen as well and I've taken a, I took a uh, drum lesson with him and I know that he's pretty, pretty crazy with that stuff yeah. as well. At, a, at the higher BPMs, is that, the more conducive way of playing that stuff so you're not completely burning your fucking legs out? Well, what did I say earlier? I didn't like it when it hurts. Right. So, which is kind of ridiculous with the, you know, I will be an absolute hypocrite about that, and I'll go back on that a little bit later. But yeah, <laughs> um, I was never really good at, at traditional heels up double bass. I had it for a while, and it worked, and then I just kept trying to push it and push it, and then it just kind of fell apart. Um So I kind of got into this, kind of like stumbled on this by accident, and I worked on it. I went to the practice room. I think I, this is going to be around 2004 or so. Mm -hmm. I started going to the practice room. I was doing four hours a day immediately after work, five days a week, just because I found this technique 
that I was like, holy cow, this could be the future of, of, of death metal. I actually said that to my girlfriend because my girlfriend immediately, at the time, she goes, that'll never work. That's stupid. And I'm like, fuck you. This is the future of death metal. Go sit on the couch. Right. And <laughs> so, so I, I kind of like, well, maybe it is. Yeah, so, right. So I went and I did that and I started developing this thing. Um, it actually came from, I, I saw a guy named Joe Stronsick. He had a technique called ballistic double bass. Mm -hmm. And he had all these methods, you know, odd pedal settings and very specific manners of doing things. But I was just like, can I just do this with a regular set of Axis pedals? And can I do this? And can I do this well enough that I don't have to, you know, have a, a weird trigger setting or a weird pedal setting? Because the, the heel-toe double stroke thingy was around. But dudes were like, they have these cockeye pedal setups that wouldn't allow you to do anything else really with the pedals. Yeah. So I started playing around with it like that, and eventually I was able to, to develop it. And the next trick was how do you make it work with the triggers? And I think the only thing I ever really had to do was just make sure the kick drum was totally dead. So large pillow in the kick drum, it doesn't fucking matter. It's not like they're putting a microphone in there anyhow. Yeah. But and that's kind of how it went. So... <clears throat> And as far as like acoustic volume, as far as I know, I'm I'm not any quieter than a lot of the guys that are playing at, you know, mm -hmm. 260 and above. Right. Because I've heard a lot of these guys that play, you know, because nowadays it's just like, oh, he, that's that's 260 single strokes. But just so you know, <laughs> he's playing single stroke. And there's like death metal is funny because like the music police involved in it is just it's hysterical. You know? I bet. It's hysterical, and when I was young, I'd pay attention to it, and it, it fed, it fed me. It, it gave me a lot of anger. So, but nowadays, I'm like, are you guys really still talking about that? <laughs> like, I saw, I saw it on the fucking Facebook the other day, and it, it, it read like a 2001 relapse message board entry. Wow! If anybody out there remembers that, but <laughs> so yeah, triggers, um, articulation. You know, because dudes started playing their feet. Like they play their hands. Yeah. And so you can hear that. And on the lower end of the spectrum, it's easier when you're an opening band and you can supply a decent sounding kick drum to a sound guy that doesn't know what he's doing because you're just playing some little bar. Yeah. So there's that. And yeah, it's cool. And just like you put the triggers in your ears and you pay attention to what you're doing and you really pay attention and you really start honing your technique. And next thing you know, you have these razor sharp, like you have this razor sharp technique with yeah. your feet. There are guys out there that can play shit with their feet that they can't play with their hands. Wow. <laughs> it's Fuck. funny because cause all they want is the blazing double bass, but they don't really work on the hand techniques. So you're like, brrr, brrr. I'm like, what? Yeah. The last thing I want to say about triggers that <laughs> bone of contention that's really irking me lately is I get a lot of messages from people. How do you set up triggers for the double strokes? And that just tells me that they're not really playing a clean open stroke roll with right. their feet exactly because it's not a it's, it's really not a fast track to being able to play this shit really fast i mean it can be if you're going to do this like close stroke dribbly bouncy little thingy mm -hmm. and you know some guys do that and like you know don't get it twisted it's it's still an open stroke roll every note is still there yeah i still spent approximately three and a half, four months, four days a week, three hours a day to develop this thing. Yeah. And I developed it with it with the mindset that I wouldn't have to have bizarro settings because still at the end of the day, I'm on the lower end of the spectrum. I'm going to be rushed on stage, 10 minute changeover, get on stage, do your half an hour, and get the fuck out of my face. Right. So it's not like I can get up there and have funky settings and weird little requests. Sure. I have to be able to actually play this so it it is an actual technique I, I don't care who says it isn't right and if you're sitting there going oh it's so and so single strokes well you're just an asshole because it's like <laughs> it's death metal it's the devil's music there's no rule system we're all Seriously. artists it's an art we're you know bleh. anyway yeah. so i'm sorry tangent yeah death metal traditionalists it's kind of an oxymoron oh man leon leon del Marte, he used to be an impaled uh -huh. That guy's hysterical. He 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 made he made that comment the other day about 
grindcore elitists. Yeah, then there's that. So we got death metal traditionalists <laughs> and grindcore elitists. Here's some fucking music police in general. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh my god, man. So as a guy that that uh, gives lessons, uh, what is one of the more common misconceptions that you hear from the students that you give lessons to? Is there one that you've noticed? Yeah. How do I identify a quarter note? Okay. And how everything just kind of lands on that quarter note. And then you tell them practice with a metronome? Yeah. Well, what I do is, um, like, because, you know, a lot of guys, they come in, they want to, uh, the, 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 the two things I get are, I don't know, blast beats and handwork. And I just, I actually just started teaching this, this one kid very recently. And he has this really good, he has this, the starts of what's going to be a great double bass technique. Uh-huh. But he doesn't really understand one, two, three, four. Uh-huh. One, two, three, four. Yeah. One and two and three and four. Subdividing music. Basically, you know, and teaching them how to lock these things in with a basic quarter note. You know, you listen to Slayer. Da, 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 da. Mm. Whoa. What's your head doing? Right. One, two, three, four. Meshuggah drives it home big time. Absolutely. But they subdivide the crap out of it. They subdivide the absolute shit out of it. <laughs> but what is amazing is that heads are still not due to the quarter note pulse. Yes. So, so I, I get a lot of that. I get a lot of guys that want, they want to go real fast. And that's awesome. But I get a lot of, I feel like an old man because I feel like I'm teaching a lot of people how to walk before they can run. For sure. And who wants to hear that? You right. Know, when you've seen... You come back from a, a Nile concert and you see George just melting shit. I want to do that. And I'm like, okay, well, here's a couple of building blocks and I'll talk to you in 10 years. Right. You know, it's the fast track. But then again, given the instantaneous access to information that is the internet and not understanding the trajectory nor the journey that it takes from A to Z, you see just Z or wherever they are in the alphabet of progression. Yeah. And it's just like, well, yeah, I wanna, I'm going to do that. I mean, I guess as kids, we all want to do that. But then sooner or later, you have to realize that it's going to take a lot of fucking work for you to get there. There's a lot of demystification yes. that, that a face-to-face teacher will give you. Yeah. Because, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll pull up a guy on YouTube, and you'll look at him, and then you'll pull up a single-foot blast beat, 260 BPM. Yeah. How to, you know, you cross, you do all the cross references in YouTube and you can come up with a thousand different guys that have a tutorial on how to do this stuff. And that's cool. But, you know, music is communicating. Sure. And it, if like a, you know, great story comes in mind that, that I will paraphrase really quickly. Uh, you know, a guitar player, friend of mine who met this kid online who wanted to do a music project with him. So he goes over to this kid's house, and he brings his guitar with him, and the kid has not a guitar in sight. He's, he's like, where's your guitar? And he goes, oh, it's in the other room. And so he gets out of his guitar, and he starts playing. He goes, go get your guitar. And he goes, and he gets his guitar. He gets his eight-string headless Kiesel or something like that. And, you know, my friend's got, like, a Gibson SG. Right. And he like, starts playing this stuff. He's like, okay, I got this idea here and this, and plays it. And the kid's like, okay, cool. Um, and so he, like, learns it, and he writes it down. Okay, I'll work on it, and and we'll play it next week. So they can essentially like leisurely cut heads and, and like trade musical ideas. And yeah. this kid, unfortunately, had all the technique in the world. He had all the gear in the world, but he had no ability to communicate with another musician oh. on that level. And uh, probably won't do so well on a tour either. That going back, referring back to what we were talking about, right? Earlier. You know, he's gonna make. He's going to do computer music. He's going to make yeah. his music on the computer. and But when he gets into a band, it's probably not going to work. When he probably gets out on the work. road, he's probably going to get sick and it's not going to work. It's that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it is very important with the state of the music industry right now because we're in this disposable music industry you know, For thing sure. right now where it, it blew my mind when my brother was – because my, my brother, he was – doing he was a techno dj not techno i'm sorry a junglist at one point mm-hmm. and he would explain to me that he would make a mix and it would be outdated within a day within a handful of days and yeah. it was just like he would have he had this whole stack of records that he was never going to use again because it was just outdated and i was like well that's fucking ridiculous <laughs> you know i've got this miles davis record from 50 years ago Woo! and um <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and music has become that. You know, yeah. people like it's just on to the next thing and but well, yeah, it does like, tie back into, I think, the, the limited uh, attention span due to the bombardment of information. Oh, absolutely. And, and increasing dependency on devices and in doing so, an inability to connect on an interpersonal level because they haven't established that that kind of dialogue. Did you realize that we're at the beginning of the internet, as, yeah. Joe, Rog- as Joe Rogan would put it? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that all, you know. It all ties in. I work at a music school. Okay. I work at the the Collective School of Music in Manhattan. It used to be called the Drummer's Collective. Okay. And every day, for eight hours a day, I'm just in this hub of learning from musicians, yeah. from instructors. It's cool. Yeah. It's really cool. And that is an art that just, it needs to stay with us. It really does need to stay with us because... Everything else is getting cheapened and thrown away, but I think live music is going to stick around. Yes. And I think the ability, I think people are going to want to start hearing natural sounding live music again. Mm-hmm. I think people are going to be really over, I mean, after a while, it's just, it's got to stop. I mean, how many more absolutely perfect death metal records can you listen to? Right. There's no fun in that anymore. Like, I don't want to listen to, I don't, if I want to listen to MIDI you know, MIDI's fun when it's a Nintendo, when it's when you're listening to like Nintendo music. I have a whole file of it. Sure. And it's fun to practice too. You know, I have a I have a couple of origin songs rendered into MIDI. Yeah. But I don't know. Like so much of this stuff isn't even it's just not real. So it's it's weird. Well, I mean, with genre-specific music, which I think you're pretty heavily involved in, are there many bands out there doing it today that that you that get you excited? No, there's not. I think you played on a pretty interesting record in that Gore Guts record. I think that's a pretty non-traditional, as non-traditional as a death metal quote-unquote record could be. I feel like you know, dissonant, ethereal, a little bizarre string arrangements. There's some weird shit going on on that record. Gorguts is interesting because <laughs> when I started doing that, I was my I had my buddy Mike, and he was just like, "Well, I mean, as long as you just play Erosion of Sanity over and over again, I'm like why?" He goes, "Absolutely, because why? Because because that's the Gorgut sound." I go, "What is the Gorgut sound?" He's like, "Gorguts has not done one album twice." Yeah, I guess I guess the first two records were similar, but. Then there was Obscura, and then there was yeah. Wisdom to Hate. And it's like, they've always done a weird record. And so we're getting into that. What's it going to sound like? I mean, I guess it's going to sound something like this. I had these demos I was playing around with. And he's, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. You was know? it? A, was it? Let me ask you this then. Uh, just interject for a second. Was it a challenge uh, getting into the nuances of kind of a more, a less traditional you Remember know? how I said I've 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 achieved I've received multiple like step ups like yeah. power ups. So that was this another was a big one. Yeah, I bet this was a big one. Yeah, and I can fill pages on my Gorguts experience. It was as far as I know, those guys are wonderful. Um, Luke was probably he was probably a painter somewhere back in the 1700s. Right. You know he's because he, that's how he. That's how he, he he crafts music. He um he's like a Renaissance painter. He like he's got his guitar on, and then he's got his hands up. And he's like, okay, um, the symbols are gonna da da da, right? And he's like really and he's you know he's really influenced by classical music. Yeah, classical orchestrating. Music. Yeah, classical degree from in violin from the Conservatory of Montreal. No shit, I didn't know that. Really? Wow. Um, I believe. Yeah. And so you have him, and you know. And he's very, very French Canadian. He's very big, <laughs> boisterous. No, 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 no. And I'm like, <laughs> awesome. And I don't, you know. And then, and then there's Colin, Colin Marston. Uh huh. 
um, NYU graduate. Oh. And he is just, I maintain Colin Marston is the smartest man in death metal. For real. I think he, I, I just, anything I can throw at him, I can go, hey man, kick this back at me in sixth grader. He's like, oh yeah, cool. Well, here's how you play the, you know. Really? This is actually in, you know, 17 and 16. Some of it, but you got to do this. And you listen to this and you count off of this. It's just like you're playing in 4 4 here, but we're over here. So he, and this sounds like a bunch of mush, and it kind of is because it's hard for me to remember a lot of these things, but yeah. like learning a lot of these bizarre Gorguts passages that were in odd time signatures, and then they would jump into other odd time signatures. It's a 3 a 7, a 3 a 7, a 4 a 5, a 3 a 7, and a 9. Huh? Was that a tempo map nightmare? Um, well, the funny thing about the Gorgut stuff was, is that's, I didn't quite understand. Um, that's like before, I, like, I think maybe four of the songs on that album were recorded to a click. Wow. Okay. And the rest of it, I really just had to learn how to count and just write down numbers. I know I've got a notebook around here with a lot of that stuff in there, but so that's kind of how, that's how I did all the Gorgut stuff with just these weird number patterns and all that stuff. And just, just count it. For the listeners, there's, that is a string of numbers that looks like an aut- borderline autistic person. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then when it comes back, instead of going into the eight punches, it just goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and then. And so with the Gorgas thing, there, it, like nowadays, I can, I can just open my computer and I can open my little music editor and put my little click on and I can one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, one. You know, I can mm-hmm. add all these little th- these little roadmaps that make things. Oh, interesting. Much easier, but back then, no. Right. Oh, God. I mean, as far as tracking it, if you're trying to get, I don't know how often that really happens anyway, that you get one solid take from front to beginning, I'd imagine you got to punch in. But I would think that it would, was that not a little freeing to just play it and not have to be so locked into a fucking click track the entire time? The thing about the Gorguts record was we did so much pre-production on that album and and it got delayed. So we even had more, and that's, I credit that to the, one of the reasons why I'm not in that band today is because the way the, the, the way it was looking was that the album was going to come out just as Origin was getting off tour. Okay. Like just as Origin was finishing the Entity, I think, Entity cycle, mm-hmm. the Gorgas record was going to be coming out. So I was going to be able to focus a lot on that. But it ended up getting delayed because lawyer, manager, lawyer, manager, record label, record label, lawyer, manager, record Bullshit label. Bullshit bureaucracy. Ah. And so that album ended up getting very delayed and so we put in more practice time and yeah by the time we went into the studio in in, in montreal we went up to a wild studio <coughs> wild studio way up like a handful of hours north of montreal out in the woods yeah it was like being on the set of the shining almost that sounds awesome so by the time we got up there we were sharp and so a lot of those songs are for all intents and purposes, front to backs. Not complete front to backs, but very close. So that actually ends up being a really organic record. And it sounds organic, whatever. It, it sounds. I think it does. It sounds real because it is real. Right. That's interesting. So it was captured. That's good. Mm-hmm. And you even had, like, oh, it sounds like, uh, sounds like so-and-so is getting tired on this part. No, leave that because that's kind of cool sounding. Sure. You know. So that's talking, referring back, kind of back to what we were talking about earlier, kind of bringing the human element back mm-hmm. into otherwise overly quantized sort of mechanized yeah. death metal. I think people are going to, like, that was always the cool thing. You know, how, I mean, like Van Halen, 1984. Fuck yeah. You know how many, there's, have you heard the stick clicks all over that fucking thing? It's all over the place. It's everywhere. I maintain that the top of Hot for Teacher is still kind of a little bit of a mess. I, I, I'm not sure. Did he over, overdub yes. bass drums? Had to he, That's It's three layers. Okay. It's three layers as far as I'm, as far as it's been explained to me. I mean, that's what I hear is multiple bass drums. And I also hear him kind of attempting that Billy Cobham thing that's on the top of the Spectrum record. I think that was his version of it. Quadrant that's, Four. Yes. Quadrant Four. Yeah, that's definitely... A, yeah, Quadrant Four was definitely there. Um, you have 
a bunch of Hertz's and 16th notes as the first layer. Uh huh. And then you have this kind of a Swiss triplet thingy in the second layer. Uh huh. And then you have that dum da dum da dum da dum da 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 dum da dum da dum da da right thing as a third layer. Right. And then the actual beat comes in. And right. The beat comes in, and that's that's the quadrant four piece. So yeah, and you got a you got a handful of guys. One of the students at the school, he's like, oh, I learned it, and I learned it in the car. Do you go to my? I had to. Which part? <laughs> the the motor section from the beginning. Right. He had to. He was going to audition for a Van Halen tribute band, and Hot for Teacher wasn't on the list, or at least the beginning part wasn't. But he just got it in his head that he was just going to learn the 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 motorcycle piece. Uh. And he figured it out. He said he kind of knew what was going on. So like on his hour and a half car ride over there, <laughs> he's just like, huh. And he told me that he just had like a notepad on his dashboard. He just kind of wrote down these ideas that he had. Okay, I think it's this. I think it's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, one, two. I think it's five hertzes and one of the and, and four sixteenth notes. You know, kind of right, thing. Right, right. And then he sat down. And he kind of fiddled about with it. And then, like, when it came to you know trying it, he actually played it, and it it worked. Yeah, and the dudes were just like, "What? <laughs> that can be played?" You know, he's done it. Mike Mangini's done it. Thomas Lang have done it. Right. So, like, a lot of people can play that, and then you. Uh, but it's a fascinating piece of music. That whole thing, that drum for drums specifically. Yeah, that's the best thing that guy ever did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and he's one of my favorite drummers too. Alex Van Halen's one of my favorite drummers. But I've heard some live recordings where I I I, I thought he was maybe. And I, look, I I am no one to talk. I enjoy a little bit of my own sloppy, non-specific uh, playing, but that is that is borderline falling apart at times. And not to talk shit on Alex Van Halen because I absolutely do love Van Halen and his drumming, but I have certainly heard uh, some live recordings where it was it was it was not necessarily holding it together. Maybe there were some drugs or drinking involved. Is what I'm thinking. Well, they're a bunch of old men now, and what do you expect? Yeah, and I've actually I've never really heard them attempt to play it back in the day, so I wouldn't know. So I really wouldn't know, but I did hear that awful, that awful Tokyo Dome rec- live record. Yeah, you know because Van Halen was actually the first rock band I got into when I started to rebel against my parents and get. Oh, into, that was that was the gateway. Get Van into, Halen. Get into all that evil heavy metal in the eighties. Was 80s. it ni- was it nineteen eighty four specifically that? Yeah, record? my sister got me that. My sister bought me 1984 on cassette tape. That is badass. I had it on. I had it on record, and then I got it on cassette tape, and then I had CD, and then digital. I've had it in four different, me four too. different versions. Me too. Well, you I, and I are probably close in age. I'm assuming I'm, I'm 76, so I'm 42. Me too. Okay. I thought you were telling me you were 76. I'm 76 years old. I bathe in formaldehyde and then sleep in mothballs. Born in 1942. That makes me 76. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So 42. The answer to life, the universe, and everything. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Absolutely. When is your birthday, man? February 26th. Oh, wow. You're, you're five days beyond my son, so that would make you a Pisces. Yeah. I'm a Cancer. I'm July 4th, 1976, the ultimate bicentennial birthday. How about Woo-hoo. that shit? Congrats. American AF, my friend. AF. That's the year Kiss put out Destroyer and Rock and Roll Over. Oh, dude. There are so many records from 76. Just mid-70s in general. I have over 300 vi- records. What Sin Lizzy record came out in 76? Ooh, boy. That would have been uh, Fighting, or which is my favorite record. Fighting is a good record. Uh, Johnny the Fox is no joke either. Jailbreak was 76. Jailbreak might have been 76. Yeah. Well, we could also we have we have phones smarter than ourselves. We could just look this up. Yeah, right. My girlfriend was going through this hysterical list yesterday. Things that white people love to say. We'll never know <laughs> before pulling out your phone and doing a Google. Well, it, there was a time, and I'm old enough to remember it, where you would actually default to that. We might never know the answer to this question. It's rare that I have to press pause for a piss break, but we've been ranting and raving about drums and fucking classic rock. And speaking of which, uh, we spoke a little bit about uh, Van Halen. I'd like to talk to you about Iron Maiden because I remember, I think, let's see, I'm going to go, I know that Power Slave came out in 84. That is the first Iron Maiden record that I got. And I was absolutely transfixed and obsessed with it. Uh, And I probably, maybe I got it in 85, but it came out in 84. And one of the interesting things about Iron Maiden, if you think about it, and Judas Priest as well, is that, so in the case of Iron Maiden, you have from 1980 to 1984, they put out a record every year. So you have 
self-titled killers number of the beast peace of mind power slave so one record every year ending with power slave and which is fucking amazing and then in the case of judas priest another band that i'm a fan of when it comes to the whole brit rock thing from 78 to 82 you have a record per year and five killer records being stained class hellbent for leather british steel point of entry screaming for vengeance in 82 so i think it's amazing that both of those bands put out a record a year five killer records both of them at different time frames but still that's fucking amazing. You got to add Kiss to that list. Oh, you're a big Kiss guy. Nah, I was when I was a teenager. You okay. Know? Um, I, 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 every now and then I'll like try and listen to those records, and it's like, well, <laughs> does it hold up as much? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, but yeah, that that's just indicative of that time, right? Because I will... think Judas Priest and 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 and, uh, and Iron Maiden holds up well, way better than of Kiss. course, sure it does. But as far as the album per year, in some cases, two albums per year. These guys, they do an album, yeah, they go on tour, and like, and they were just blowing up so fast that like the record producers like new album go, and so right. like new album, another album, <laughs> shit, and they're on tour and like fucking we're at an entire month of your tour, keep going, and yeah. next thing you know, they're four albums in, and one of the dudes leaves. Because he's tired. Right. Yeah, I bet. And that happened with Van Halen. That happened with Judas Priest. That happened with Iron Maiden. That happened with Kiss. That probably happened with Thin Lizzy. That probably happened with... Everybody. Well, yeah. I mean, ACDC, as far as I know, is still doing... Jesus you know. Christ. But, um, it's incredible. No, Iron Maiden. Did you know? Did you read that thing that Ruskin Arms got shut down? What is it? Ruskin Arms. The, 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 the venue that they started at. No. Yeah, somebody got his head stomped in. Oh, my God. For real? Like the security or something like that? Uh, some, like some, Jocko some, Pastoria style? <laughs> shit. Yeah, I, I read just the other day that uh, s- something happened. Some dude got really hurt. A lot of law enforcement. And, oh, my God, we're closing the doors. No shit. Yeah, Ruskin Arms. If you've seen that old school footage yeah. of Iron Maiden, the black and white footage where they when play they first Charlotte started the Harlot, out, yeah. that's Ruskin Arms. No shit. Yeah, it, that venue that, that I, I know about Ruskin Arms because... Like any other Maiden fan, had the ten wasted years VHS yes. set, you know, VHS tape. So yeah, I kind of read about that. And I was like, wow, that's really kind of sad that I'm not. A, I'm absolutely not attached to that. But right. it was just like to know about it. Well, what was your first Iron Maiden record? Well, the first one I bought, weirdly enough, was um, I bought a used cassette version of Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. Oh, so you were post? So I actually got an Iron Maiden before you. Probably. Yeah. Because that's two records later. Maiden is like, I, I look at Maiden in a very similar way that I look at Maiden made heavy metal digestible. Maiden allowed me to listen to Slayer. Because before, Slayer was just way too aggressive. And a way, fucking I onslaught. I figure it out. Like, oh my God, oh, whatever the hell. And I listen to Iron Maiden and it's like, okay, what is that drummer doing? Ding, 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 ding. What's the gallop? with that ride cymbal sound? Quick little right What's foot. What's with that fucking ride cymbal sound? That ride cymbal sound, allow me to brag, people, but this is that ride cymbal sound. 22-inch bell ride. Sound reflector. Okay. Sound creation. Sound creation. I'm a Meinl in Dorsey, so... So you can't get Chris, a two-inch prop. Chris, though. I'm sorry, but Chris understands... My attraction to old classic era Pisces symbols. Sound creation, New Dimension Bell Ride 22. This is the symbol that you hear on all those albums, all the Nico records. Yeah. Incidentally, That's it. apparently it's also the symbol that Stuart Copeland was using. Nice. Now, when Pisces stopped making these for Nico, he, hold that, he had it's a this dense made, fucking symbol. And boom. Oh, you got the Power Slave Bell Ride. That's the Power of Slave. <laughs> Somebody's an Iron Maiden fan. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's just that he had that, like, Nico would have that stick height that he was like, his stick was back here by his ear, and mm-hmm. then he's just laying the whole side of the stick. That was one of the things I really paid attention to with that guy. Why is his ride symbol up there? Well, why is his ride symbol also covering, like, half of one of his drums? I know. I never... <laughs> What the fuck was going on with that? Well, I mean, like, when I first started seeing these Iron Maiden videos, and he's got 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 
18, I think. 17? Yeah. I think no, no, probably yeah. 17. I'm, something like that. Something weird. And his snare drum is up here in his face. Right. And he sits low as fuck. He sits fuck. low. Yeah. His right cymbal's here and he's hammering it like hang, hang, hang. sticks turn backwards. Fucking great drummer what the though. What hell's man. with that guy? On Why does his face look like that? Oh, he used to be a boxer. I don't know. Oh, but, his um, nose is smashed to shit. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> So Nico became my favorite drummer, and to this day, probably like he's definitely one of my. He's favorites. fucking great, man. And Nico, Iron Maiden was the band that took me out of, you know, Cinderella and Kiss and like all the hair bands of the '80s. Iron Maiden was like, whoa, yeah, yeah. Are these guys devil worshippers? Steve Harris was driving that sound from the get go. It's that gallop. Yeah, it's the English. It's equestrian rock. It's <laughs> fucking. I never thought about that. You it know just what? makes me want to play polo and listen. And to I it. love how Henry Rollins bashes them. Does he? I just think it's so funny the way he does it. Oh right, so he got this book right. It's made of like it's like uh, Lewis and Clark, and they go out and they go on a boat ride, and like one dies. Right, mate. All right, cool. It's just song like. I, I, and that's what he does. Whatever. He, he like Rollins man had to go on in front of Iron Maiden and it was awful for him, I guess. And he's I'm got sure it this, was. That's a terrific pairing. He's got this bit where he just beats up on Maiden. It's like, oh, okay, so Iron Maiden. I guess what you do is you buy a book and you read the cover flap and you write lyrics. Brave New World. Right. So this man, he's like Yeah. <laughs> Stranger to Strange Land. Oh, I read this book last week and right. like, I got this song, right? <laughs> and it's so funny. And I remember my buddy being an Iron Maiden. Fuck this guy. I go, no, don't fuck this guy. Yeah. He's smart. And <laughs> he's smart. He just doesn't like Iron Maiden. Right. <laughs> That's fine, too. But. Well, how many times have you seen him live? Let me ask you that. Maiden or, or Rollins? My, M- Maiden. 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 I saw Maiden on the Fear of the Dark tour. Okay. So that was, uh, yeah, it was that was awesome. It was Corrosion of Conformity on the Blind album. Dude, I saw that. So Corrosion. Blind came out in 1991, and I saw them open up for the Rollins band. That was sweet. How, what a weird fucking sweet. coincidence that is. It was Corrosion of Conformity, Testament, Iron Maiden. Whoa. So Testament had put out The Ritual, Iron Maiden had put out Fear of the Dark. Yeah. So I saw that. So that's the first time I saw Maiden. And then when I was out with Skinless, it's like we were in Texas somewhere, and it's just like... Hey, the show tomorrow is canceled, but my friend is booking the Iron Maiden show, and we can't pay you anything, so here's a whole shit ton of Iron Maiden tickets. Whoa. So they gave everybody on the tour package Iron Maiden tickets, and we just went Iron Maiden. That was Motorhead Dio Iron Maiden on the Dance of Death tour. Holy shit. How was Dio? No, he was Dio. He was wonderful. And then the, the last time I saw him was maybe roughly three years ago at, uh, at, at Madison Square. Okay, I saw them at Barclays. You so saw them at Barclays, that was after. When that was maybe, Ghost. yeah, 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 exactly. So I saw them prior to that when they came through Jersey, and I think it was 2008. I just looked it up recently. And that was a super killer set that they played. Uh, they played Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. They played all of this killer stuff off Power Slave. Uh, the set was pretty pretty ridiculously awesome for them. And that was the first time that I had seen them, despite being a fan since... You know, like I said, maybe like 85, you know? So it was, it, that was a long time coming, needless to say, but fucking fantastic. That band is so goddamn good live. Yeah. Um, no, they are. And here's the funny thing is when I saw them at, at Madison Square, I don't remember most of that show. And I, to this day, I'm pissed at myself about that. You got wasted? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and it wasn't even as cool as it was supposed to be because we got to the. We started, me, me, me and two of my buddies, we started drinking at the house. And then we got on the subway and we made a road. I mean, so, you're going uh, to see Iron Man. You're getting excited. You're yeah, fucking... we were fucking getting excited. The sun was out. It was nice. We're on the back patio. We got some beers and some, oh, fuck. We're going to go with Maiden, right? And Heavy like, metal parking lot. Woo! That's exactly what we did. Then we got on the subway. We made ourselves a road soda, which was that much soda and that much whatever the hell yeah. it was. You could, you know, strip paint off your car with it. Of course. Drank that. We got down there and we're all three of us seeing double. And we get in, and we're like, holy shit, there's a bar here. Let's <laughs> go to the bar. Yeah. <laughs> so we go to the bar, and we're like, I want a can of Trooper Ale. Yeah. And she's like, I'm sorry, we're out of that. I'm like, we're at Iron Maiden concert. The first band hasn't played. And she just goes, no, no, you don't understand Iron Maiden concerts. I'm like, well, I guess you're right, ma'am. So we ended up drinking Bex, and we're just like, the funny thing was is my buddy got up 
my buddy, he's like, the pathway, go. Yeah. And so we start moving, and he's like, he's like a person ahead of me, and he slips through, and the gates close. And it's just old school maiden fans. Boom. And I like try breaking through, and it was like six people just went, whoosh, and just pushed me back. And I was just like, okay, I'll just stay back here. And I was only maybe five rows back. Yeah. I was just like, there's Bruce Dickinson. So it was still, I mean, it was That's like... That's still badass. Yeah, it was great. I know it was great. I know I had a great time. I know I didn't do anything bad. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I just don't <laughs> quite remember the set. <laughs> and I'm still mad at myself about that. That sucks. But um, we actually, we saw a priest recently. Maybe two months ago. Maybe two and a half months ago. How was it? Perfect. I was blown away. And I was, no shit. I, I was looking for I was looking for the holes because... I was under the impression he couldn't do that anymore. So was so am I. Someone to, I got under the impression that Halford couldn't sing anymore, and that explains Redeemer of Souls being kind of mm-hmm. whoa. Here's the lyrics. Right. I'm Rob Halford. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. But they were and killer. Firepower came out, and I'm like, whatever. Firepower, fucking Judas Priest, and I listened to it's it. It's a pretty damn good. It became my favorite record. Yeah. I, I, you know. Yeah, it's really good. That's like MTA, back and forth, constantly, firepower. Um, and then my buddy was, I was like, yeah, we, we, uh, Simone, my, my fiance, we were up in, in Saratoga Springs, and my buddy Jeff was like, we're going to see Priest. And Simone and I had a couple of beers, and she's like, yeah, we're going with you. And I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah, we're buying tickets. I'm like, okay. So we go to, yeah, Bethel Woods. Bethel Woods is the actual place where Woodstock happened. No shit? Yeah. That's where you saw a priest? Yeah. Really? So because it's Bethel Woods, the co-headlining tour was Judas Priest and Deep Purple. Whoa. But because it was Bethel Woods... Dude, I'm a huge Ian Pace fan, Deep by the way. Deep Purple takes the late show, which is cool for us because we got to get back in the car and get back to Queens. Okay. So we stand there. We're in the lawn when I watch Priest, and I guess I had tears in my eyes. <laughs> I don't fucking know, but I'm like watching. I'm like, okay, it's interesting because we were out because they had the roof thingy, yeah, and then we're out in the lawn. So when you hear the background vocals, when you hear anything background, it kind of sounds like a really loud AM radio, yeah. And there was minimum backing vocals, ah, just so like the reverse reverb high screams that would, you uh-huh. know. um, but yeah, that dude can actually. I was so shocked that he can sing. Fuck. I was so blown away. And my buddy Sam Walters is a vocalist of Driven Mad. Uh-huh. And he's in a project that I have that I'll explain later. Okay. He is the Rob Halford fan. Yeah. And I remember just, you know, at, you know, meeting Sam at one point and it's like all I'd just ask him about all these vocalists. I'm like, so what about Rob Halford? And he goes, technically that guy shouldn't exist with the way he sings. Oh, and 100%. How did he not burn himself out? It's crazy. He did, like three times, apparently. You know, but, well, what about now? Well, I think he just got himself some confidence and probably a vocal coach. And maybe some surgery to fix whatever. Possibly. He got his yeah. vocal cords scraped, as has been said. <laughs> oh, God. Because pull-ups, sounds horrific. pull-ups yeah. up here, and you cut those off, I guess. Kilos God. or whatnot. Oof. But yeah, I guess like the way Redeemer was was received was like, ah, oh, Halford can't sing anymore. Yeah. and then, But he actually... He sang Breaking the Law no instead shit. of just walking side to side. Right. Letting the crowd Holding sing Holding the mic. He sang Breaking the Law. Fucking A. They did Desert Plains. They opened with uh, um, Delivering the Goods. No shit. That song rules. All right. What the fuck? What's going on? Delivering the Goods. What's happening? This fuck is yeah. And you know, nothing against Deep Purple, but Deep Purple has no place going on after Judas Priest. And they opened with Highway Star. Wow. And it was just why? priest that had already killed why? it, huh? Yeah. Wow. And like when they got done, Palford's like, We are Jonas fucking priest. <laughs> Throws his mic down and like storms off stage and we're just like, Oh shit. Wow. Like, yeah. <laughs> like What the fuck was all that? So yeah, it was really fucking cool. So that was great. And I mean, where's the priest maiden to her? I know, right? Can you imagine that? Fuck. Or is that? It might be. It might be too too much, man. Too many cooks in the kitchen. You know what I'm saying? I don't think so. You don't think so? Well, there's no KK Downey and Glenn Tiffin at this point. True. So Judas Priest is Rob Halford. I mean, right? Honestly, it's probably Ian Hill. Yeah. When you think about it, Ian Ian Hill has is is 
a force as constant as volcanic rock I yeah, guess fuck, he's yeah. been there for 40 years doing the exact same thing yeah I am real. convinced that he runs that band yeah I could be totally wrong but should KK Downing be in that band right now while Glenn can't be I think he should yeah just like I think Dave Lombardo should be in Slayer oh with, 100% with with Jeff being dead so yeah. I think KK should be back in Priest I do I don't think it's gonna happen right because it seems like it seems like I've seen multiple entries on the internet that I've I've vaguely paid attention to where KK goes, yeah, Judas Priest, blah, 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 boo. And Ian <laughs> just kind of goes, uh-uh, that ain't right. Right? <laughs> right? And Halford goes, no, fuck you. And so That's KK keeps internet. saying things and they keep shutting them down. Yeah. KK, stop it. Yeah. Well, or, let me ask you this, man. When you think about uh, records from the 80s, are there ones, we, we've talked about ones that maybe don't, necessarily hold up what records do you feel do hold up because you know interestingly enough i think screaming for vengeance certainly still holds up and obviously they had plenty but all the iron maiden ones hold up interestingly enough twisted sister i gotta say that's also super nostalgic for me for me one of the first records that i ever got but stay hungry and uh stay hungry is 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 a flawless record dude it's so good um fuck motley crew shout out the devil still pretty i don't like motley crew really never been a fan I was for a while. I liked him at one point. I think I just got sick of him. Yeah. And unpopular opinion. Sorry, boys and girls. I don't like Motley Crue. Yeah. I don't like Vince Neil. I don't like Tommy Lee. I don't care for Nikki Six. I like Mick Mars. Mick Mars is that the guy. guy you know. is cool. <laughs> I don't. Like the... He's like the George Harrison Come of on. Motley Crue. He's just. That's he's amazing. the oldest dude. Right. He's the most fucked up dude. Yeah. He, and he's a fucking great guitar sure. player and he wrote some serious riffs. Right. I just don't like, like, people want to say, separate the art from the artist. No, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, it, it just doesn't work. If you find out that your favorite musician is a total scumbag, I mean, I can't. <laughs> I, I still have Bill Cosby himself. I'll probably never watch it. Right. Just those dudes. I mean, you know, and I don't think Nikki Six did anything wrong either. I think yeah. Nikki Six just. Uh, uh, I mean, he was writing th- a lot of those songs and the lyrics and I the think pop businessmen his in the back. heart stopped and he goes, Yo, I died on the table. And I think most of the doctors are kind of like, Well, this kind of happens. Most of this is not a big deal. But everybody was like, But I died. It came back. And, right. You know. Um, Kickstart my heart. Then ensues. But at the same time, Vince Neil, <laughs> no, go away. Really? Leave me alone. You mentioned Cinderella earlier, and I got to say, man, <laughs> nothing for nothing. That song off that record still kind of holds up, man. Can't tell you anything about Cinderella. I had one record. <laughs> I had one record by Cinderella. I, I, I it's had, the one. I had one record by Winger. I had one, one record by... I just For a while, I just went through all these bands. I just bought up all these bands' yeah. records I had. It was the 80s. Boy, by the way, that was, song, She's Only 17 from Winger, probably wouldn't go over so well these and days. now she's 43. <laughs> right. Yeah. Started off as an illegal, now she's a MILF. That's that's the updated version of that. Yeah. I mean, I heard that they... I, somebody told me, I think it was one of the guys in Suffo told me that uh, that they've they've like kept up with her. And instead of saying, and she's only 17, that actually, and now she's 43... Is what they're singing now. I gotta look it up. I'm not. Whoa, a, it that's was, hilarious. I mean, that's pretty funny. I mean, what else are they gonna do? Yeah, they're not gonna sing. She's only 17 no, no, in 2018. No, no, no. no, no. I mean, depending on what state you go to, I suppose that's that's legal. You know. Yeah, you could do that all over the Midwest and the South. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not gonna do that on either of the coasts, right? You know, <laughs> New York City and California. All right, yeah, I they sing the original it. in the Midwest and the South. They alter it for the for the uh, East and West coasts. <laughs> so here's a question for you, man. Uh, you do jiu-jitsu, which I think is is borderline crazy, uh, just for fear of getting my limbs fucked up. As someone who's broken my hand and cranked all my ankles from n- not doing jiu-jitsu, but uh, what what is it that attracts you to it? Is it the strategic nature of it and the the excitement of of physical contact i was doing taekwondo as a kid okay and i liked how that made me feel back you have the body type of a wrestler i mean i'm i'm short and stalky yeah um we have opposite body types you have a good size head a good set of hair uh (laughs) i I, for instance good set of hair (laughs) i'm all limbs yeah 
all limbs works for jujitsu as well. But yeah. um, no, I, I did. And that was like that was a conversation that that happened between me and my old boss when I was living in Saratoga Springs. Um, yeah, like I used to do Taekwondo because he was he would he was doing all these martial arts. He goes, "You should go back. You should go back. You should yeah. go back. You should go back. You should go back. You should go back." I go, "I just don't know if I should. I don't know. I don't want to do Taekwondo anymore." He goes, "No, don't do it. Don't do Taekwondo. Go do something else." Go do boxing. Go do jiu-jitsu. Go do Muay Thai. Go do one of these like legitimate martial arts these days that'll actually prepare you for walking home at three in the morning by by yourself. Yeah. And so I don't know what the jiu-jitsu. I don't know how it became jiu-jitsu. But yeah, I um, what I did was yeah, I I spent in two thousand eleven. I spent approximately four months on Skyrim. And I was 230 pounds. I'd 230? I'd home from work. I'd play Skyrim for six hours. If I had a day off, I'd get up in the morning, and I would play Skyrim from morning until the evening. Jesus, dude. Because at this time, Simone was like traveling back and forth from New York City yeah. up to Saratoga Springs. So I would have multiple days in Saratoga Springs by myself and a very flexible work schedule. So I'd just go home and just play Skyrim. And I went on tour. And came back. I turned on Skyrim. I'm like, I can't do this. I guess I should call that jiu-jitsu guy that's down the street. Because he was not too far away. So I went and I looked at it. And I kind of like walked in there. And I watched a class. And the instructor, Eddie, was just like, um, you played. He was like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a death metal musician. He's like, oh, cool. Do you know this guy and this guy? And I'm like, I know that guy and that guy. He's like, you know this guy and this guy? I don't know those fucking guys. He goes, yeah, I grew up with those guys. I went to high school. I'm like, what the hell? Cool, cool. Yeah. So you want to try a class? I go, yeah, I'll be here tomorrow. That was it. That was it. No shit. And then I, uh, yeah, so I started doing jiu-jitsu. And at one point in time, I was doing jiu-jitsu and boxing. Yeah. So Monday, m- m- Warrior, it was Warrior Wednesday. Okay. Is what, what, what we called it. War- Warrior Wednesday. I, I had Wednesdays off, so I would get up in the morning, and I would go do three hours of jiu-jitsu in the morning. I'd come home. I'd take a nap. I'd get back up, and I'd pick up my buddy Nate, and we'd go to the boxing gym in Albany, and we'd box for an hour and a half, and then we'd shoot straight back to the jiu-jitsu school for the evening class and do another three hours of jiu-jitsu. Damn, dude. That was Warrior Wednesday. I went from 220, 230 pounds down to 194 pounds. No shit. Yeah. Just sweating your balls off. Just doing- sweating and getting my cardio up, and playing drums became easier. Wow. Um, a lot of it has to do with, in jiu-jitsu, you're learning how to engage your core. Uh-huh. You're learning how to use all these muscles in here, which are kind of not as visible at the moment because I haven't... Actually, I haven't... <laughs> I'm going back to jiu-jitsu on January 1st. I I think I found a new school that I'm going to hit that's right around the corner from my apartment. But, okay. Um, yeah, so I was like, I just got gobbled up and I got... I, and like that's when I discovered the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah. And that's when I that's when I got into the bulletproof coffee thing. Yeah. And started watching MMA and started paying attention to just like just kind of entered here and then just all these sh- and just got kind of whipped into this this orbit. Yeah. And met a lot of really interesting people. I bet. Um <laughs> And yeah, so uh, you know, and I haven't I've uh the thing about the the thing about hurting yourself in jiu-jitsu is that I got off stage one night in Belgium and stepped on a piece of pipe and folded my ankle completely 90 degrees. Oh, Jesus, dude. And sprained my ankle. Luckily, with the double stroke technique that has no lateral motion, luckily, the sprained ankle didn't do anything oh, for the Jesus. technique. Oh, Jesus. You were so, I was so lucky. Very. So I was still able to play. And then I get into doing it. like, well, what if you get hurt with jiu-jitsu? Like, mother. I'm going to fall down the stairs at my job and hurt myself yeah. quicker than I am hurting myself at jiu-jitsu. Wow. It's ridiculous because, uh, you know, starting jiu-jitsu at 30-something and way past my mid-30s, I'm not going to go running in there like I'm 19. Yeah. I go in there. I'm asking all these questions. I'm being very cautious. And I've never been like... Knock on wood. I've never been... I, I, I did sprain my other ankle in jiu-jitsu, <laughs> but I've never so been that. really, I've never been hurt so bad that I couldn't play drums. Yeah. I, I, I always taper my training off, uh, the, the two weeks leading up to a tour. Okay. What I do is I'll, I'll 
break I'll get down to like one two one to two days a week with jujitsu and get more into playing drums. Okay. So I like one the if I'm far away from touring like I am right now, I don't yeah. think anything's happening until the summer. Okay. Wow. I'm about ready to get on the other side of Christmas and just hit the jiu jitsu and Muay Thai. Fuck yeah. Um so that's what that's gonna be. That's what that's what the whole winter is gonna be for me. And then as we get more into spring, I'll be communicating with Paul from Origin more, and I'll be hitting more drums by then. So that's kind of how that cycle goes. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, with the jiu-jitsu thing, old man jiu-jitsu, okay? I'm 42, so yeah. what I'm good at doing is slowing down the young kids. They want to do all the flips. I can see where the flips are coming from. I can catch this kid's leg. I can pin that leg. I can step over. I can grab his arm. I can start wrenching him into a Kimura. Yeah. You know, and so that's kind of how my jujitsu works is that I know how to move slow and relaxed. Mm -hmm. I know how to watch everything. That's part of it. I know how not to get hurt. Right. Important. Now, if I get confronted on the street, that's That's a different different scenario. Different story. Yeah. If you're practicing any kind of fighting, you're practicing your C game. Yeah. Because your A game is to run. Your B game is to negotiate. Yeah. If you can't negotiate, if you can't run, then you're getting into your C game and that's when you're fighting. Sure. So, you know, don't ever try this. I mean, if you can't get away from a dude that's trying to rob you. I mean, well, actually, I guess your A game is give him your fucking wallet. Really. <laughs> yeah. Give him your wallet. Give you know, the phone, whatever, make fine. the phone calls, get your card turned off, you know, whatever. Yeah. You can get a new ID, all that. Fine. So maybe your fighting is your D game. But otherwise, if you can run, if you can negotiate, get the fuck out of there. Don't stand there and fucking fight these people. Right. Because even if you do fight this guy, even if you do have this sick rear naked choke that you've practiced for years and you're good at it, and I am, I know that if I put a guy in a chokehold, I don't know if he's going to go on the ground and start swallowing his tongue or go into an epileptic fit right. or whatever the hell. Don't exactly want to kill someone. But. No. I mean, you don't. I mean, if you can... The whole idea of jiu-jitsu is getting control of the situation, subduing the guy and talking to him. Yeah. And getting touch. If you, if, I'll let you go if you chill out the fuck out. And you go, okay, cool. And you push him away. And then you run. Sure. On the different side of it, <laughs> jiu-jitsu, you know, it's so fun. <laughs> it is dorks. Yeah. It's bankers and lawyers and waiters and just dudes that just want to do fight training but don't necessarily want to be super brawny shitheads about it, you know? Sure. Let me ask you this one, man. What yeah. do your parents think about the music that you've played thus far? Well, um, my mom has only been to one of my shows. And I don't think my mom enjoyed the music as much as she just enjoyed the overall energy of the whole thing. And it's probably my mom seeing you. Just saw me doing this big, cool thing that a lot of people were into. And that sure. made her happy. Of course. And she has voiced being very proud of me multiple times. You know, we um, we did a you know sick drummer. We did a, a live cam from St. Louis on the Hate Eternal tour, mm-hmm. and I it's like it's getting up to it's over fifty and a half thousand views at this point. Wow! It was twenty some thousand views in under twenty four hours. Jesus! And so she's happy to see that kind of a thing. She's yeah. happy to see that. She's happy to see that it's being accepted. That people are into it. My dad, he died 11 years ago oh man and the thing about him was interesting because he was a jazz musician and he uh i don't think he wanted me to be a musician i think he saw my mom getting an education and Mm -hmm. being a nurse and i think that's the path he wanted me to follow yeah because you know he was always kind of reluctant okay well cool i'll take you to this gig and i'll show you you know and it's not that he didn't support me and or anything like that but i don't think he wanted me to live his life Right. 
which I'm doing a lot of the dumb shit. I've done a lot of the dumb shit he's done. You know, my sister goes, no, 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 no. You're not your dad. I'm like, I'm kind of my dad. She's like, right. no, you're not your dad. But um, he didn't want me to make the mistakes he made. So sure. he didn't want me to be a musician. You know, I know I caught his attention towards the very end, right before he died with this thing I did. I did an Angel Corpse record that was, that was, I never even saw the band. I just went in with click tracks and notes and just played the drums and sent them down to Florida and that became a Lucifer and Lightning. Wow. And so he goes, you did a what with a what with a what? You know, I'm like, yeah, all I did was play the click tracks. I had notes in a notebook and just did that. And so he found that interesting. But yeah, yeah, for all intents and purposes, I think he wanted, he wanted me to go get educated and have a real job because he was like trying to breed up. So, right. So that's that. I hear you. I have a son who's now turning 10 months old and I've been wondering what it is that he'll be attracted to and whether I want to encourage him to be a musician uh, or at least pursue it solely, you know, or just be creative and have that and have have jobs. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the world's going to be like in fucking 20 years. None of us do. But um, I, I have a, a child that I think about all the time and I think, my God, what am I going to tell him in a completely different world. So it's a kind of a fascinating perspective that I now have that I wouldn't have otherwise had clearly, you know, but yeah, that's what I think about. Yeah. It's interesting that you say, what are you going to tell him in a different world from today? It's fucking. Yeah. Cause I mean, you got a grip on it now. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're young enough so we know what's up, but, but as we get older, we, we become more detached. Of course, dude, you see like you, there's, People that are, you know, you got these dudes that are like, these fucking millennials these days and their YouTube culture and their... And they are kind of little fuckers, entitled little fuckers. I'm like, okay, cool. Look here, old man. I'm not going to talk to you if I need to learn how to use a computer program. Right. If I'm going to... I've got this studio I'm building and I know a dude who's younger and I know I'm going to talk to him. Sure. He's going to show me how to use this shit. And so you got a lot of these old dudes that are really pissed off that they're seeing their 1989 just get further and further yeah. away. And these young kids are fucking, they, they suck. And of course, they do in a way. But they do in a way because you're not familiar with this culture. Yeah. It moves on without you. It leaves you. Yeah. And you're Fast. mad that it's leaving you. And you're, you're stuck there. You know, Let me tell you something about back when, like, Iron Maiden used to play at the Madison Square Garden in 1988. Right. Great, Grandpa. Tell me about how your music was. Yeah. They don't give a fuck. You know, they, they've got <laughs> they've got fucking death grips. Yeah. And Greta Von Fleet or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I ain't going to beat it up, but I don't want to. <laughs> no, Greta Von Fleet doesn't sound like Led Zeppelin. Sorry. Nope. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. It's like, I, I, my friend Andrew is 20. He's 20. Six, twenty-five, and the only the only dad comment I ever threw at him was is like you need to shut the fuck up for twenty years. And you get to forty, and then you can have an opinion. And he's like, "Whoa, damn!" <laughs> there is some truth to what you just said because now <laughs> that was all. I mean, it was all done in jest. It, just, it is, but when you think kid, about but... what you thought you knew twenty years ago, and you know, as opposed to what you know now. You realize how much of a fucking walking asshole you are. I'm speaking for you. I, I should speak for myself. but I, No, you could totally speak for me because <laughs> I actually saw Gene from Angel Corpse only yeah. a couple of weeks ago in Florida. And he goes, oh, yeah, so uh, seems like your chops have uh, really kind of come up. And I'm like, Gene. You've been working your dick off for you 20 need years. You understand that when we started, the shit I went through and you saw it. And he just kind of goes, well, yeah, that's how it was back then. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, dude. That's awesome. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. No, I was a fucker when I was young. Yeah. And it sucked. It sucked. Yeah. So I can sit here and tell you these Angel Corp stories and be like, back when I was 20. Sure. Um, and just kind of giggle about it because that's the thing, dude. If you're, you're going you're gonna to get older and you're not going to stop it. Right. Well, that's the so question. So figure out a way to get good at it. There's so much cool shit you get to do when you're when you're when you're getting older. It just so happens you don't get to tell the young kids about it. Right. 
You don't get to go, look, little youngin, back when I was your age, I understand, but now, and he's like, ah, you're going to die in 20 years. You know, that's what you're going to get. So you just don't. You don't, there's a divide, and you just don't fuck with it. Just leave yeah. it. Just leave it. How just, long do you foresee you being able to play the extreme music that you presently play? It depends on how I get to travel. If I have to get in a 15-passenger van and set up all my own gear all the time, probably not long. Yeah. Um, Origin, last year, in, on, in, in October, last two Octobers ago, rather, we got into a bandwagon for the very first time. And I don't know if you know what a, a bandwagon is. It's a box, it's a large box truck basically fashioned into a miniature tour van. Okay. So, you know, usually when we tour Europe, we're in a bus. And you're in a bus with three other bands. Right. So, it's, it's, so if I can not drive, if I can have somebody help me set up the drums, I don't need a tech, but if I got someone that can help me. Yeah. And if I can have some sort of a, a schedule that can get me good food and all my, 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 my five little needs that I, I need, I can do this for a long time. Yeah. You know, it's not the physical aspect of playing that, that is really the hard part. It's everything else. If you, if I have to drive eight hours, sound check. Oh, shit. The only thing nearby is Taco Bell. Okay, well, I'm going to go eat fucking Taco Bell. Come back. Break it down. I feel like check. crap. I got a pound of coffee now. Right. Get on stage. Play the set. Feel yeah. wonderful for approximately 45 minutes. Get off stage. Break down the gear right the fuck now outside in the winter time because it's cold and they got to get the techno DJ in for the 10 o'clock set and then holy shit we got a 12 hour drive immediately jump back in the van <laughs> and drive yeah you know and luckily uh, Paul's the night driver so he drives but I still got to get up at six in the morning uh, so I'm still only getting four or five hours of sleep on a bench in a van and hey can we stop and get something all there is is the gas station great hit the gas station oh cool it's yeah. fucking it's roy rogers hard to sustain you know that. oh uh, okay I'm, I'm lucky if i can get a granola bar and a bottle of water it's roy rogers so a lot of it's a lot of those those things you got to look out for um luckily with the hate eternal tour with with with, with hate eternal Eric has this sprinter that he's built with bunks and all that stuff, and it's Eric's sprinter, so Eric drives. Nice. I'm driving. He's got one other guy he trusts to drive it. Sweet. So all I had to do on that tour was just was all I had to do on that tour was sleep. So that tour was um, pretty easy when you think about all that kind of stuff. Um, getting, like I said, getting food can be difficult sometimes, but you know it's just about. Being able to set myself up to where I can eat healthy and get my sleep. Yeah. It's a min- pretty minimal requirement we're talking about here. Minimal requirement. But hard to get. There needs to be some... I, I need to be able to pay the bills. Yeah. You know. So, yeah, there's a handful of little things, very simple little things that I need <laughs> that that a lot of times just aren't provided. Origin does pretty good, so yeah, it's not too terrible. I think we pretty much covered it all, man. Uh, we're opening beers with hammers, which is a nice. It's very metal, by the way. I, I like your style. I don't know if that was intended. Probably not, but uh, I do appreciate it. I would have used the drumstick, but I don't know. Yeah, you did that earlier. I was impressed with that. That's the. I've never actually, despite doing this for twenty six years, I don't think I've ever opened a beer with a drumstick, which is fucking stupid. So I'm gonna have to do that going forward. So I appreciate. If there's anything I learned from this interview, it's that at some point or another, I need to start incorporating drumsticks into opening my beers. Well, yeah, you just use a back end drumstick. You just use the back end of your drumstick. You use it like a lighter. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's it's a it's a leverage, not power thing. You That's know, right. You can actually, oh, I've I've opened plenty of beers with my with my shitty carabiner key ring. Yeah. Oh yeah. Is, Anything you, you can know. get up underneath there. So, uh, yeah. I just don't like the thing where you you put the where you put the beer on the table and you, you hang it off the edge of the and table you knock and knock it off and you hit it. Yeah. And then there's foam everywhere and like the bartender's looking at you like you're an asshole. I've definitely cracked bottles doing yeah, that. Yeah, you break well. a bottle so and then you're you like, ah, I'm drinking don't wanna, anyway. Don't want to be drinking glass on tour, John. There, there there's there's something to consider, right? I've done that. <laughs> 
Well, shit, man. It was good talking to you. Uh, I'm amazed that uh, this is officially the longest interview that I've ever done on this. Uh, 118 episodes plus. So congratulations, John. You were, you were long-winded enough to, uh, to, to go this long. So congratulations. Oh, I've listened to enough podcasts with guests. I've listened to enough of the Rogan podcast and the Mark Maron podcast. And, you know, I listen to a lot of Dan Carlin. And Those are all the, great. The, 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 the last podcast guys are funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mainly. And so, like, I hear a lot of how that, like, anytime Coco Diaz is on the Rogan podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got to listen to it. And yeah, so, <laughs> actually, the coolest podcast I think I ever heard was when Rogan had David Lee Roth. Oh, that was an interesting one. Fascinating. And I, was, and we're all circling, but this all keeps circling back to Van Halen. Uh, his his autobiography is really good. Crazy from the heat. Fuck yeah, dude. I haven't read it. Oh, dude, you gotta read it. Oh, you'll well. you'll blast through it in two days. It's, Probably. It's fucking fantastic. One day. All right. You got no shortage of time, considering that you're gonna be playing this shit until you're 80. So, uh, yeah, John, no shortage of uh, reading in your future. <laughs> you can just download it. It's that's all gonna change as well. I'm big on the audiobooks lately. So I hear you. You know, all the time on the subway, so I got all the audiobook time. There you go. Well, John, it was good talking to you, man. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm a fan of your plan and your pursuits of extreme music. And uh, shit is fascinating. At some point or another, I got to pick your brain about speedy singles. I'm not good at speedy singles with my feet. Uh, no, hands. Oh, yeah, that's easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I figured you got that on lock. Uh, right on, man. Well, it was good talking to you, bro. Uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Maybe we'll, I'll uh, go to a jujitsu uh, class with you. Cheers, buddy. All right, everybody. Thanks, John, for rapping for nearly two hours. Good loud, my man. Keep your eyes and ears peeled for John's many pursuits. Sometimes you just got to go see him in action to even believe what the hell he's doing. Tune in next Monday and every Monday henceforth for another explosive episode of the Crash Bang Boom podcast. We'll catch you on the next one. Crash Bang Boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep.